The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the new Now Next in Higher Education Marketing Webinar. My name is Nicole Forschler-Horn. I'm president of JMH Consulting, and I'm going to get us started. Now, before we dive into the webinar, I want to let you know that if you have any questions, we will be trying to answer questions towards the end of the webinar. I can't promise we'll get to everyone's questions, but we'll try. I also wanted to let you know, because I recognize how busy everyone is during the day, um, if you have to leave during the webinar or take an important phone call, we are recording this webinar, and we will be sending out the recording towards the end of this week. So don't worry. Um, if you miss something, you'll have the chance to re-listen in or share with your colleagues something that you learned. Our speakers today are John Horn and Jim Fong. John Horn is the CEO of JMH Consulting. We are a higher education consulting firm that specializes in enrollment management and marketing, and we work with universities across the country and in Canada. John is speaking today because he's a leading expert on data-driven marketing in higher education and also serves as JMH Consulting's lead consultant on marketing engagement. Many of you may have seen him speak. He's a dynamic presence in the field of higher education for the last 15 years and has delivered dozens of presentations at regional and national conferences and for other higher education associations. Jim Fong is the founding director of APSEA's Center for Research and Strategy. And in this role, Jim analyzes demographic, occupational, technological, and societal trends and data to help higher education better serve the adult and corporate learner. As the center's director, he works closely with members in new program development initiatives, enrollment management, and marketing process analysis. And he also reviews online and continuing education portfolios. So let's take a look at what we're going to be covering in today's webinar. If we can flip to the next agenda, there we go. Um, we will be looking first, Jim's going to start us off with a look at the landscape of higher education marketing trends and also recent and upcoming changes to major online marketing platforms advertising opportunities on secondary social platforms. John will be looking into that. Also taking, uh, also examining listening tools. So social monitoring tools to help you manage your social presence. So you aren't taken off guard when someone has a concern about a program or is praising your program. Um, and also engagement. And for engagement, we're gonna talk about marketing automation tools to scale your marketing efforts. And there's several out there right now that we've been looking at at JMH Consulting and are beginning to use. And this allows you to extend further into the conversion funnel. And of course, as I said earlier, a Q&A to wrap things up. Um, so I'm going to turn over this conversation to Jim, who will start us off with an overview of the landscape of higher education marketing, and I'll circle back around um, for Q&A towards the end. Jim, go ahead. Thank you, Nicole, and, uh, and thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, we've got a lot of topics to cover. <clears throat> My job is really to, to tell you what's uh, probably a few years out and what's going on and what the situation is. Uh, the slide in front of you really kind of illustrates that we're in really exciting times and we're also in really scary, kind of scary times. Uh, a lot of the research that I've done has shown that <clears throat> we're actually into this cloud generation right now. And now we're moving into robotics and AI. And all of these things have, have really disrupted and opened up new opportunities for folks. Uh, and it also trickles into what happens with marketing as well. All this technology that's happening right now uh, doesn't limit itself to product and services. In fact, it actually impacts how we, how we promote things. And so John will get into a lot of <clears throat> new technology advances. I'm here to tell you a little bit more about the landscape, what's driving uh, some of this and what to look forward to. <clears throat> as I mentioned here, change is happening all around us. And I study ecosystems and some of the things I'm looking at right now are are, are kind of interesting. I mean, the, the one thing that's really happening here is the retail sector is a mess and, and we can, attribute some of this to 
to folks like Amazon, Walmart, and other folks like that, really driving the whole uh, online retail sector. <clears throat> and also, traditional retailers really not uh, being as proactive or progressive as one would think. As a result, you know, we're going to see 6,000 store closings uh, in the next year, you know, ranging, you know, from our our technology companies to Bed Bath and Beyond to 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 other to other providers there, uh, and we're also going to see a lot of layoffs that that are going to happen as a result of that. I mean, Macy's and Sears and all these big mall re, uh, big box retailers are are announcing layoffs. <clears throat> I've estimated that at least half a million people will become displaced this year. Where are they going to go? And what's going to happen? And so what we've got here is we've got a lot of AI, 3D printing and new technologies that are entering the marketplace that will drive a new economy. And uh, <clears throat> and so new specific sectors within there are going to benefit. I've highlighted autonomous vehicles and drones. Just last week, the House uh, approved, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles uh, being being more, uh, more aggressively uh, tested on, on, on the roadways. Uh, a lot of the constraints were lifted off. So each major manufacturer has allowed 25,000 autonomous vehicles on the, on the road this year. If they, after an independent review, the year following, they might be allowed 100,000. And so that's what's actually being agreed upon. So while the pundits were saying five years ago that we're not going to see autonomous vehicles to 2050, we're seeing them in 2020. In fact, there's a good, there's a high likelihood that there could be half a million uh, autonomous vehicles on the road in just a few years. <clears throat> so there's also going to be drones and there's also going to be delivery and transportation is going to change pretty massively. And I also note that, you know, we'll also have personal robots as well. And so all these things are happening, and, it, and it's not George Jetson or, or anything that's, uh, that's uh, futuristic. That these things are right in front of us. The whole Internet of Things is happening. Google yet just yesterday announced that they're opening up the language in terms of their Alexa. And so more, more Internet of Things are going to connect up to Alexa in, in, in as a result. So that's going to drive all sorts of new technologies. <clears throat> Uh, wearables are also going to change as well. Apple just announced their their watch, and there's a lot of new technologies that are coming out. With even Google Glasses is coming up with a new with a new uh, update in terms of its technology. All this stuff is changing. Money is changing. We we have less physical currency in our pocket, and we're moving to our digital currency environment there. And <clears throat> and so all these things are, are are rapidly changing. But my question out there is higher education changing. Uh, you know, if you look at the National Student Clearinghouse data, they've shown 10 straight periods of declining enrollments nationally. That's five years of straight declines, when in reality, it should be increasing. We've got higher high school graduation rates and flat to increasing uh, numbers in the 18 to 24 year old segment. So all these things should be saying that higher education should be increasing. <clears throat> Quite frankly, it's not. I think it's showing signs of aging and not keeping up with, up with the economy. Uh, higher edge, you know, colleges and universities were were keepers of the torch or keepers of the flame, and I think that they 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 may, they control the credential. And I think business and industry, as a result, has has gone a different direction, <clears throat> or has uh, has really infused other things like MOOCs and other and things like that. So, just one other statistic: the MOOC environment is is one example where higher education, you know, has compromised with business and industry. Over 2,000 new MOOCs were were offered this year. That's 2,000 new classes. In fact, 18 million new users to MOOCs uh, came on board between 2015 to 2016. So our world is changing dramatically. <clears throat> and so the other thing that's happening here is the, the next, I think the next big thing is, yes, online is easier and everybody knows about the online. Alternative credentialing and badges is the next thing. And it's following a lot of shifting in demographics, which I'll talk about shortly. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> So how does that impact marketing? You, you can't have technology evolve and change all around us without marketing changing. <clears throat> so I've spent a lot of time tracking marketing, and there's a lot of crazy things that are happening here. We just seem to have mastered search engine, uh, engine optimization and paid search. A lot of universities have, okay, that's pretty much the standard now. <clears throat> My first bullet point so shows that search advertising is, is about 50% of the spend. But that's not necessarily going to be that way in the future. In fact, it's expected to decline. Google has invested a ton into AI. <clears throat> and in fact, a lot of my searches that I do on my phone through Google are, are voice related. All these technologies impact how your advertising is going to show up. <clears throat> the biggest game changer in all this that I see is Facebook. Facebook 
you know, they've, they've put a lot into their, into their search advertising. They've also made it so you can do video ads uh, more effectively. They've actually poured a lot of money into getting advertisers to pay more in terms of video a advertising. And as a result, that's actually becoming a, an evolving medium very, very quickly, in fact. They're competing head-to-head -head with YouTube and others. Uh, but the biggest game changer is the email. Uh, Facebook Messenger <clears throat> has disrupted the whole email uh, channel platform right now. I mean, basically a lot of communications are happening within the Facebook platform. In fact, you know, they have 1.3 billion uh, users in terms, of, in terms of Messenger. That's up 300 million in just a year. So they've created this whole ecosystem <clears throat> that's, uh, that's kept a lot of communications within there. So it's shutting doors there, just as Google changes its algorithms for, for, for search and paid search and whatsoever. All these things are happening that that it's really making advertising really challenging. And also, you know, even though we don't hear much about LinkedIn anymore, LinkedIn is pouring billions of dollars into their infrastructure as well. I think they're gonna be one of the next new platforms for the whole badging initiative, but as well as paid advertising and, and other, they're trying to be, they're basically doing a me too with Facebook, but more in the business world, but they're also developing new technologies and investing a lot into AI. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff within marketing that's so hard to keep up with. And as university marketers, you folks have got a lot of challenges in front of you, keeping up with te technology, keeping up with budgets, working with higher education, who, in my opinion, really does not uh, fully appreciate or understand the marketing environment. So I wanted to just give you a snapshot of what I saw <clears throat> that's happening within the UPCA community. I, I am one of the keepers of the UPCA marketing survey. I work with the, the UPCA marketing and enrollment management uh, uh, group there, and they, they're doing some wonderful things. And I'm going to put a little plug in. We have a conference in December, and it looks like it's going to be a great conference <clears throat> where other UPCA marketers are coming together. But, it, you know, it, it, we're, we're going to also be launching a, a, the, the survey coming up soon in the next few months. But until then, I, wanna, I talked to some of our UPCA marketers about all this ch change and chaos that's happening around them. <clears throat> and they've basically said that, you know, just when they've kept, when they've mastered a technology, then now they're on to the next one. The technology is, ch is changing so quickly that they can't keep up with it. And so they've started investing more into content marketing and they've invested more into video. <clears throat> they've also started using social media more uh, related to content marketing. But the one thing that keeps on changing here is they've always, their, their professional development has also, uh, been a struggle. They've also had problems with, with keeping up with the analytics because all these new platforms are just so fragmented and not even speaking to each other. And John's got some insights about that, that there's, it merely makes it for a difficulty in terms of uh, planning more strategically, planning budget, it's planning staffing, communicating upward in terms of the hierarchy within higher education that marketing is important and marketing requires money to be spent. And so all these things are really challenging for the UPCA marketing leader here. So, you know, there's a lot of chaos with technology. There's a lot of chaos with marketing. And I think that chaos trickles down into our, our marketing situation among UPCA marketers. So I wanted to share with you some of the tangible evidence about why, uh, why marketing is challenging. So I wanted to share with you some demographics of a study we just completed a few days ago. So what you have in front of you is some a survey of 600 uh, Generation Z, 20 to 22 year olds. I mean, Generation Z can be younger, but we can, we limit it to 20 year olds and the 22 year olds, and uh, then millennials, 23 to 30. Not the full uh, spectrum of millennials, but <clears throat> we wanted to get at younger middle aged millennials. Interestingly, you know, you can see this, but the top the top line actually got cut off here is, is females, and the, that that top group there shows females. Uh, the number of times they eat out a month in terms of young generation Z females is 7.8. <clears throat> Males, 5. Point, uh, male Gen Z is 5.88. So, but if you, you look at the averages, about the same. Uh, however, what's really interesting here is that <clears throat> if you ask them about their television viewership, female middle uh, mid millennials, they spend about 20 hours a week watching video on television compared to nine hours a week on, on the internet. If you look at if you look, um, so that, that's females. If you look at males, they actually uh, are pretty consistent in terms of video uh, across the internet, but they have, you know, they have a, a, a different uh, uh, volume in terms of watching on, on television there. So, you know, you can see some viewing habits that differ. However, the interesting thing here is that Generation Z watches more 
uh, video on the internet than than on a television, 45% compared to the other cohorts. So it's kind of interesting there. But we, actually, which we, where, where the biggest changes are is if you look at Snapchats, females do about 10.34 Snapchats in terms of Generation Z females a day compared to 5.24 for Generation Z males. <clears throat> if you look at mid-millennial males, it's only 2.47. So compared to Instagram, 7.42 for, for female Gen Zers. And then you, and you look at uh, male, uh, if you look at males, males typically communicate with Facebook, uh, especially those that are, that are older mid-millennials. So you've got all these different <clears throat> uh, communication tools and entertainment tools and statistics that would suggest that marketing in this generation, especially marketing higher education, is very, very challenging. You've got a lot of fracturing of media, a lot of different tools, a lot of different media preferences that makes for you know marketing to be much more expensive, sometimes much more challenging and and much more technical. So I can uh, really uh, kind of relate and sympathize with with you in terms of the challenges that you face. But I think it also opens up new opportunities for for marketing successes along the way. And I think that's where where John is really going to sh share with you some of the tools that that he uses for a number of colleges and universities to kind of help overcome these these technology challenges, these cultural challenges within higher education, these demographic challenges with with uh, with evol with this evolving uh, generation here of adult learners. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Jim, um, <laughs> and and thanks again for uh, as, as Jim said, he's going to set up this mess that is there uh, out in the marketing world, and then turn it over to me to try to solve it all for you guys. Um, and I will go on record as saying I, I am not going to be able to do that today. Um, but what I am going to try to do is to build off of what, what Jim is saying about these shifts that we're seeing, and, and they are happening quickly. And it's, 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 no, uh, it's no surprise that, that many of us that work in marketing and higher education are having a tough time keeping up with all of the new marketing techniques, the new marketing platforms, uh, and the new marketing um, ecosystems that are that are really developing um, and and then redeveloping uh, quickly. What I'm going to do for you guys is I'm going to start by talking about uh, some of the change that we're seeing happening on on major marketing channels. Um, uh, I'm I'm going to talk about these. We we refer to these internally as the big five. Uh, they're all fairly mature as far as this online marketing goes. Uh, fairly mature marketing platforms that we use quite often with with our clients. But I'm also going to talk about a few newcomers, um, new marketing platforms that you may have never used, you may have never heard of um, on some of the sort of up and coming social media platforms. Uh, and then as Nicole said, I'm going to move on to talk about some social listening and some marketing automation tools um, that are starting to emerge um, at, uh, in, into the market. Um, so the first thing that I will, I will discuss um, is, as, as we kind of get into talking about these platforms, we have been tracking the, the cost per click. There's lots of metrics, obviously, that, that, that we can track about these, these various platforms, cost per lead, conversion rate, uh, total spend, click-through rates, etc. But you know, cost per click is is a very basic metric, uh, but it's one that provides some interesting perspectives into how people are using the the various platforms. So if you see this chart, it goes all the way back to 2012, and what you can see is the orange line, Google Search, has has kind of went up in 2012, 2013, 2014, and has kind of stabilized at least amongst our clients as to how much we're paying for every click. Now we certainly have programs such as MBA or criminal justice uh, master's degree where we're paying way above this, but this is kind of the average and it shows that, that to some degree, costs on Google have kind of stabilized. But if you compare that then, what I find is interesting, compare that to LinkedIn, the yellow line, or to Facebook, the silver line, that kind of actually dipped down. And in, in around 2014, Facebook was kind of positioning itself as an awareness platform. That's how a lot of marketers were starting to see it. And then they came out with a radically improved targeting mechanism 
uh, in 2015 and suddenly were able to demand a, a higher price per click and have been closing the gap up with um, with with Google search and and being search back they, they've kind of hit Bing so I think what's what's really interesting from this data for us is how is how Facebook and LinkedIn are able to demand a, a higher cost per click because they're getting better and better at helping us marketers reach the right audiences because we wouldn't be paying more for these clicks if they weren't working at some level. Um, and, and I think we're going to see that continue. They, 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 those two platforms, Facebook and LinkedIn, in the last couple of years have been ones that I would say have been have been um, improving or or adapting faster even than than Google, certainly than Twitter, um, which has seemed to kind of flatline in terms of its development for the last couple of years on its ad platform. Now, kind of moving off of that, so let's look at some of the things that that have been changing. So the first thing I'm going to talk about actually is an upcoming change. If you are a Google AdWords advertiser, you may be uh, you may be in the beta right now um, for the most significant change to the Google AdWords interface in, I think, around 12 years. Um, so Google is completely redesigning the AdWords look and feel. Um, Many people are, are having, there's many different reactions to what the new interface looks like. Right now, some of the capabilities of this new interface are, are limited, so you can't do everything you can in the other interface, which I think is, is contributing to some frustration among power users. Um, but this, this new interface is really following the trend of moving toward mobile users. So this interface is designed so that it is more mobile friendly than their current interface to allow people to kind of move off of apps and manage actually their, their Google AdWords advertising from a mobile device through the web if they want to. Um, and, and that sort of follows the, the trend of, of more and more moving toward mobile. In fact, many of you may know last year Google changed its search results page so that they removed the ads that were running down the right side and changed to a one column layout with ads above and below um, the, the sort of regular organic results. And that change was 100% driven um, by the movement toward mobile search, uh, which now makes up, as, as Jim was talking about, a, a you know about half of all searches that are that are being done. So we've got a big interface design change from Google. They're also introducing this is kind of a small thing, but I think it's a really interesting um, addition because of how important search. Uh, search marketing is and what a large proportion of, of many schools online marketing budget uh, Google AdWords represents within this new interface so you can't do this in the in the current interface but in this new beta which will roll out very soon across the board you can actually restrict your search ads to only show to people in particular household income so if you have a program for instance that is a um, a, a, a graduate degree or even a, a sort of graduate certificate and you say, you know, I'd really like to just reach households that are in the top 50% of income or the top 30% of income. Um, you can you can do that now for your search ads, which we've never been able to do before. So that's an interesting new addition that is currently active, but only through this new beta interface. Um, they're also Google is introducing a new extension. So if you hopefully if you're using Google AdWords, you are using some of the extensions. For instance, they have a call out extension. They have a phone extension where you can show people a, a phone number that they can click to call from their mobile device. They have a site link extension that Google seems to be just rolling out more and more of these extensions. This is the most recent one that they um, are in the process of releasing, which allows you to offer a, a promotion of some type and to schedule that to appear with your ad just during particular times. So as an example of how you might use this, we had a client last uh, recently who said, we want to run this promotion over the summer for some of our non-credit certificates. Um, if people 
sign up or enroll before, let's say, August 1st, we're going to give them a 10% discount. Well, you can actually have that kind of messaging appear with your ad and then automatically turn off when that discount is no longer available. Um, so kind of a neat little addition, again, that, that Google is making. Next, I'm going to talk about a, a pretty what what we consider to be a pretty big change in um, in the Gmail advertising product. So about two years ago, um, or maybe 18 months ago, Google kind of re-released ads on Gmail. Um, and what was interesting about this is that it allowed us uh, Google was allowing advertisers to target those ads to people based on the words and phrases that were appearing in their emails that they had either sent or received. Um, so for example, we would bid on a lot of like association names. So if you're marketing uh, a project management program, you can, um, you can say, hey, I wanna show ads to people who've sent or received emails with the Project Management Institute in them or PMI or, um, or that have been talking about project management professional certification. Um, really great targeting. Well, evidently, um, the targeting was a little too great because Google is, is rolling that back, uh, from what I understand, because of privacy concerns. Because people are saying, so you're reading my Gmail <laughs> emails in Gmail and then showing me ads because of them. That's kind of creepy. Um, and we would agree um, it is. But from a marketing perspective, it was it was really great ways to try to reach people based on things that we know they're talking about. Um, so anyway, Google is in the process this fall of, of rolling back that ability to target. You're still going to be able to market on Gmail, but your targeting is going to be limited to more generalities that, that Google knows about people because of their demographics or because of interests they might have because of websites they're visiting that, that Google is able to track through analytics and, and other means. So we'll no longer be able to show people ads on Gmail because of the contents of their, of their email um, messages, which in my opinion and in the opinion of, of the marketers on our team makes that Gmail marketing much less attractive because the, the generalities that we can use going forward are not going to be as specific as what we've been able to use in the past. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Facebook. So I'm gonna keep moving through the platforms. Um, carousel ads are not brand new. Um, they've, they've been around for about a year, year and a half, but we are, but we don't see a lot of people in higher education using them yet. And I wanted to give a couple of examples of why I think these carousel ads are really effective. We tend to see carousel ads on Facebook having a much higher um, interaction rate or click through rate um, than just a regular ad with a photo. Uh, by the way, video ads also tend to do very well on Facebook. But some examples, I think a lot of people are struggling with, well, why would I use carousel ads? Do I put a different degree program on, on each of the little um, graphics and, and let people kind of flip through them? And what we've decided is you can do that, but it's really hard to target an audience that might be interested in several different degree programs. So what we've done is created this ad, for example, is, um, is showing kind of frequently asked questions. So this is for a degree completion program. And here people can, um, you know, we've got, we posed a, a few different things to people as to what they might click through. And then those lead to different articles on the website that kind of explain either, you know, what, what are the perks of earning your bachelor's degree or what is it like to enroll at, at James Madison to earn a, a, an online degree. And people can flip through these until they find something that interests them and then, and then click on it. Here's a different uh, approach that we took, which is for another school, um, we actually took student testimonials and we had to cut these down and, and do kind of excerpts from them. Um, but we're giving some like real life case studies of, hey, these are people that enrolled. Here's what they thought about the program. And then, as you can see, below the um, below the images, we've got some of the just the perks of the program, 100 percent online, eight week courses, et cetera. Um, so if you haven't yet started testing 
these carousel ads and using them, it takes a little bit more work because you have to create multiple graphics that would that would populate the different slides of the carousel. But we are seeing them um, almost always outperform our regular just image ads that we're running on Facebook. Um, now, one newer type of, of ad uh, format on Facebook are called Canvas ads. Um, and, 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 and I've got a, a more generic image here because we are just beginning to explore these. But what's interesting about Canvas ads, they are only for use on mobile devices. So when someone is on their, their mobile device and they see your ad and they click on it, instead of having that click take them to your Facebook page or to your website or landing page, you can have that click actually bring up a full screen um, interactive kind of visual for people. Um, and so what you're actually seeing here are kind of is the progression of slides that people would see in this Canvas ad. And they can actually sort of swipe up to move down and see the next bit of information. It's almost like a native landing page that's built into their Facebook interaction with your ad. So instead of taking them off of Facebook, um, you're keeping them there, but you're able to inform them with these visuals and, and this messaging, and then they can work through that, and hopefully you've at that point drawn them in enough and provided enough information that at the end you can provide a button that they can click through over to your website. So it's, it's almost like a two-stage ad um, that allows them to stay on the platform a little bit longer before they move over to, to your property, to your online property. Um, the next thing I'll talk about with regard to Facebook and Instagram, because of course Facebook now owns Instagram, is that video is, as Jim said, Facebook is really focused on video and how they're using video. And one of the results of that, one of the kind of disconcerting results of that is that there are all kinds of different ways that you can use video. So as you can see here in this, um, screenshot, these are seven different places that video can be used between Facebook and Instagram. And as you can see up top, you can do landscape video, you can do portrait video, you can do square video. And, and I, I, I bring this up because really there is no standard format for video right now um, out there on Facebook and, and Instagram. Um, and as as marketers who are trying to produce video more and more because we know that's what people want and that's what that's what the major advertisers are doing that's what you're seeing on instagram and facebook so we need to be producing more video collateral for our marketing but it's really challenging to know what that video even just things as simple as well, what's the what are the the dimensions that i should use with the with, with my video, should I do a portrait video or a landscape video? Because they're not easy to translate between the two. Um, and unfortunately, the answer is just, you know, there there is no one best uh, approach. Um, you know, the, the I think that the the landscape videos are still the most common that you'll see. It's kind of the thing we're used to because it's in the shape of a, of a television screen or a computer monitor. But you know, but but portrait type videos or square videos are definitely up and coming. And it's something that we're going to have to watch over the next few years because we may see a shift to more and more non landscape videos being used, particularly on on social media platforms. Um, So the next new thing or kind of um, up and coming thing that, that I want to talk about is is LinkedIn. So for a number of years, LinkedIn seemed to really not innovate dramatically on their marketing platform. But that changed about 18 months ago when LinkedIn started to more aggressively um, shift both their, their targeting capabilities, which are greatly improved. They also added for the first time conversion tracking, um, which was really mind boggling that they have been, you know, considering themselves a major marketing platform, but you couldn't tell how many actual leads or conversions or enrollments, whatever your, your metric is, you were getting from LinkedIn without using some other conversion tracker like Google Analytics. And all the other major platforms had had this for years. So LinkedIn finally rolled this out about 12 months ago. 
12, 15 months ago, and it, it works quite well. So they, they did do a good job on it. And if you are not using conversion tracking yet on LinkedIn, because maybe you built campaigns um, before this was available, I, I strongly recommend it. It gives some really good data. And with the cost per click of LinkedIn um, going up and up and up, and sometimes we are having to bid seven, eight, nine dollars a click to get to get ads to show on competitive audiences on LinkedIn. We really need to know what's working and what isn't. We can't just treat LinkedIn as an awareness platform. We need to see results from it, and the conversion tracking helps us to do that. Um, another thing that LinkedIn rolled out along with a new interface um, about a year ago and, and has continued to, to improve upon is the capability of doing retargeting and remarketing on the platform. So retargeting means simply showing ads to people who have previously visited your website or a landing page. And again, other major platforms, Facebook has had this for years. Um, LinkedIn has rolled this out now and it works quite well. Um, so you can target people who visited your website, your landing page. They also remarketing they rolled out, which gives us the ability to target people off of a list that we have. So if you have an email marketing list and your, your privacy policy around that allows you to do so, you can upload that customer list into LinkedIn. LinkedIn will try to match those email addresses, or you can do this with phone numbers. Um, LinkedIn will try to match those with your um, uh, with their users, and if they match them up, then that will create an audience that you can market to on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, they also give us ability, interestingly, to upload a list of company names to do the same thing. So if you are targeting uh, people who work at engineering firms and you have a list of those engineering firms, for example, you can upload that into LinkedIn and LinkedIn will say, here are the three to 5,000 people maybe that, um, that are employed at one of those engineering firms that you uploaded. So some really interesting ways um, that we can use LinkedIn, which is a professional networking tool, um, to try to target for those professional degrees. You know, oftentimes those end up being master's degrees or, or certifications, things like that. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great platform, and they are now innovating at, at what seems like a much faster pace than they had been for the previous three or four years. Um, so now I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on a handful of, of kind of up and coming advertising platforms. So I want to talk about Pinterest. I'm going to talk about um, Snap Ads, Snapchat. Um, and I'm going to talk about one that you may have never heard of because they re literally just released their, their marketing platform um, in the last three or four months. Um, so first, Pinterest. So a lot of people don't know, you can actually advertise on Pinterest. They call them promoted pins. Um, it's, a, it's been around now for a couple of years. Um, and for the right kinds of programs, this works pretty well. What we found is that Pinterest works well if there are people that you would want to reach who are who are using Pinterest for kind of semi-professional things. So obviously there's lots of people that use Pinterest, but if you find people that are maybe building boards around their work, as an example, um, maybe teachers who are putting together boards for lesson plans or activities that they might be doing, um, or architects that might be collecting images and, and, and such of, of buildings or properties or things that they might be collecting. So if you've got somebody who's, who might be using Pinterest in some way related to their profession, that's an opportunity to consider using these promoted pins. So there's a sort of a blow up of this ad that we helped put together for, um, for Wheelock, a, a college in Boston, um, promoting this master's in STEM education that, that's specifically built for elementary school teachers. And of course, it's embedded here in this board with STEM sort of activities, things that they might be interested in. Now, Snap Ads. 
I don't see a lot of higher education institutions using these yet, but of course Snapchat is, I mean, it's, it's big uh, and it's not going away. And those millennial generation uh, that Jim was talking about are using this in a big, big way. They're on there every day. So it is an opportunity for us to look for fine ways to engage with those audiences um, on another social media platform. Now, there's what you can see here, these are kind of three different approaches to advertising on, on Snap, um, Snapchat. You've got video ads that you can run, which are on the left. You've got filters, which are kind of overlays that, that you can place over top of um, the, the Snap uh, app. And you've got lenses, which you guys have probably seen these, are, are things that can, using their own proprietary technology, sort of overlay on top and interact with people's um, images. I don't imagine that most of us in higher education have the, the budget or the, or the audience to, to go with the lenses option, but if you are already doing video and producing video ads, it's certainly worth thinking about running those video ads as Snap ads um, on Snapchat if your audience is in that that younger demographic. Uh, and not to say that older people aren't using Snapchat, but we know that the heaviest users would be in that um, younger Generation Z or millennials kind of age group. So if that's your target demographic, it's definitely something to think about. And they have a fairly mature advertising platform. Um, it's obviously each of the the platforms are a little bit different from Facebook to Google, et cetera. But if you're if you're advertising on other um, online uh, platforms, you will recognize most of the metrics and it's fairly intuitive to use. So you get your same impressions here. You might get swipes instead of clicks, but you'll make sense of the platform pretty easily. Um, and that's what I want to talk about is is Quora. So this is the one that I said just rolled out. I think they I think they uh, released this in May. And you may have never think you've heard of Quora, but most of you probably have. If you've gone to a search engine, typed in a question, um, very often the answers to those questions or the articles that come up in the top five, top ten, um, are come from Quora. And what the interesting thing is about this advertising platform that I kind of like is that you can target those questions. So you can find questions such as, what does an engineering manager do? And have an ad that you run that brings to a landing page or a page on your website where you explain what an engineering manager do. And you might also happen to have a master's program for engineering managers. So, you know, there's all kinds of questions. You can kind of mine the Quora database for the questions. You can see the, the general popularity of each question. So you'll know kind of how many people are ending up on the Quora site, reading the answers to that question each month, and then build a budget around that. And you, you might bid on 10 or 20 different questions that relate to the particular educational program that you are promoting and have your ads only show up when people end up on the pages where they're finding the answers to those questions. So it's a really interesting way of approaching online advertising because you're hitting people who have a specific answer they're trying to find. And if that relates to your educational program, then, um, then you're in a good place. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump over here and and keep going into my um, my my second big topic um, of the of the webinar um, and talk about some kind of continuing on this this social media uh, route. Uh, uh, this is becoming you know social media advertising, whether it's paid advertising or it's what we consider kind of organic social, which is managing your uh, your Twitter feed, your Facebook page, building followers, um, interacting with people through social media. Um, you know, that's it's a whole nother side to social media beyond the paid advertising. And both are important. Both have their place. Um, unfortunately, one of the challenges of, of this is that um, there's a lot going on. You might have multiple uh, Twitter handles that relate to your programs, uh, right? Maybe each college that you're working with has their own uh, Twitter handle, or maybe each program, major program that you're marketing has their own Twitter handle. They might also have their own Facebook page. 
So one of the challenges that has emerged in social media and marketing is figuring out how to kind of control the messaging across all of those different channels to to know when people are talking about you out on social media, especially if, if those conversations are particularly positive or particularly negative and being able to step in when appropriate and engage in those conversations. So there are a number of social media management tools or social presence uh, management tools that are emerging. These are just three examples. There are far more that I can even include on this slide and have them be legible. But these are three of the of fairly well-known, most people have heard of Hootsuite, um, Agora Pulse, which is what we've begun using internally and Sprout Social are, are kind of up and comers that are gaining more and more users. Um, they all overlap. They all offer some unique capabilities and they all offer a lot of overlapping capabilities in terms of what they do. So you really have to kind of just dig into each of them to see which one is going to meet your particular needs. But let me tell you about some of the things that they that they would help you to do. So this is a little infographic that we put together to kind of illustrate the way we think about these tools and, and how we can use them. So first of all, one of the things you can do is you can schedule posts. So you can schedule posts to go out and maybe even have the same post pushed out onto Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn with minor variations on the same time on the same day or you could stagger them, but you can schedule all of this in advance. So at the beginning of the month, you can kind of lay out, here are the posts that are gonna go out, here are the platforms they're gonna hit, um, and here's the schedule on which that's gonna happen. And that allows you to consolidate those efforts around social media, which can be quite, um, quite burdensome if you're trying to do a lot with it. The other thing that these platforms let you do, or, or the second thing they let you do, is they let you, they let you discover, monitor, and when you choose to participate in social conversations that are happening around your brand or your um, or your offerings. So you discover you can you can actually mine the, the, the social sphere out there to see when people are talking about you, even if they're not sending you a direct message. Um, you can you can watch those conversations as they happen and then you can step in and, and as your um, your Facebook page or as your Twitter handle, you can engage in those conversations. And maybe we've seen situations where people are giving other people incorrect information about degree programs. They would say, oh, that program is so expensive. They charge thirteen hundred dollars a credit hour and we happen to know actually it's nine hundred and sixty a credit hour so let's let's step in and let's clarify that and oh maybe we can get that person into a conversation with an advisor at the same time so being able to do this kind of monitoring and participation across multiple social platforms and sometimes multiple presences on those platforms is one of the things that these tools can do so that your people are not spending nearly as much time logging in and checking each of those different uh, accounts on each of those different platforms. By the way, you can also do the same discovery and, and participation on competitor brands through these platforms. So you might be able to see when people are considering uh, you know, one of your competitor school programs and step in and say, oh, hey, you know, just wanted to let you know, we also offer such and such and would be happy for you to consider our program as well. And the last thing that these tools let, let you do that I find really interesting and exciting because this has been one of my struggles around organic social media for many years is to start to create some metrics reporting around them. So there are there is hard data that comes out of organic social media. We know, for instance, we can track here's how many posts we put out this month. Here's how many um, here's how many times we responded to someone else um, who uh, who might be sending us a message through face through our Facebook page, something like that. We know out of those posts we put out, here's how many engagements we got from them. 
where we're getting an average of 20 engagements per post, which would be things like likes or clicks um, or, or comments on them, or are we getting 40 per post? And that helps us to know which kinds of posts do better, which are better received by our audience. So we've begun to actually track and collect those social metrics, just like we would track the metrics off of our paid marketing, where we have impressions and clicks and conversions. Um, and it's helping us to start to treat organic social media as, um, as a more mature way for us to engage on a marketing basis, as opposed to just kind of like, you know, put an intern in charge of this and let's have them put some posts out there so we can actually see the, the impact that our efforts around social media are having. And that's, that's really interesting. So the last topic I'll talk about, and then we will open it up for some uh, for some questions, are marketing automation systems. So here's some examples. Marketo, Salesforce has a product called Pardot. There's HubSpot. All of these, again, just like with the social media management tools, all of these are a little bit different. Um, they all have strengths and, and, and less strong strengths, as we say. Um, and uh, you really have to evaluate them to, for your particular situation. So I would not necessarily endorse any one over the other without knowing a lot about how you want to use it because they do differ. However, what I will say is that the, these marketing automation systems are today kind of like what a CRM system was um, 10 or 12 years ago, where 10 or 12 years ago, people knew that they should have a CRM. They kind of st were starting to understand some of the value that a CRM system could offer. And yet a lot of people, a lot of schools, unless you were a very large department, um, were not using uh, a, a CRM system. There are still some departments today that aren't. But for the most part, nowadays, Almost everyone is using some kind of a um, customer relationship management system. So the marketing automation system is kind of where CRMs were 10 or 12 years ago in that we're starting to see them used. People are trying to figure out really how much value do these systems add. So let me tell you a little bit about what they are and what they do and why you might be interested in them. So a CRM system allows you to manage information about your leads, your prospective students, your contacts, people kind of want to keep in contact with over time. Uh, it allows you to manage activities that maybe your staff are doing. So if your staff is making a phone call out to a prospective student or sending an email, you can track that that's happening in a CRM. You can set up tasks, so like reminders, oh, hey, you know, call so-and-so, this prospective student back in two weeks, follow up on that. You can send direct emails out of a CRM. So all of that very powerful stuff and things that are really very, very helpful in the, the recruiting uh, or sort of engagement of prospective students and even current students as you do retention efforts. What a marketing automation system does, meanwhile, is it kind of combines, first of all, it, it, it has built-in email marketing. So if you're using Constant Contact or MailChimp or iContact for your email marketing, this would take the place of that. It also has the ability to build custom landing pages within the marketing automation system. So for instance, we for several years used Unbounce, which is a landing page creation tool. Well, a marketing automation system has that built in. And, as, and, and integrated with the email marketing capabilities. They also, some, some of them have search engine optimization capabilities, so you can track how well your website is ranking on search engines in relation to competitors. And they allow you to take the leads and the contacts and the information that is in your CRM and they allow you to do some interesting segmentations of it so that you're not just having one email newsletter, for instance, that goes out to all of the people who signed up, but you can actually customize that newsletter or send individual emails out to different people that have different information in them based on what you know about those people or, or what those people are doing. So there's some powerful segmentation capabilities in the marketing automation. And there's also the ability to track. This is where I consider these, these last two are what I consider to be the real game changers for marketing automation is one, we can actually see 
what pe it's kind of creepy what people are doing as they interact with the emails we send. So if we send an email and someone clicks on the second link in that email instead of the first, this system knows that and that might change how we interact with them in the future because maybe that second email was or that second link was about financial aid where the first link was about curriculum. Um, or if someone visits our website and goes to the financial aid page of the website or visits the how to apply page of the website, these tools can track that and let us know not only that those things have happened, but they can let us know the instant those kinds of things happen so that we can follow up faster. And then lastly, the lead scoring um, allows these systems using some pretty sophisticated algorithms that you get to configure to give you kind of an approximate score for each of the prospective students in your system. So if one student has downloaded a white paper and filled out a contact us form and has visited your website four times in the past three weeks, Whereas this other person simply fills out an inquiry form on their first visit to the website, you know, obviously there's a difference between those two prospective students. One has shown a lot more interest in, in your program than the other, um, and it's probably worth a little bit of extra effort to follow up with. So the lead scoring and, and alerts that can let you know exactly when certain um, activities happen are another powerful component of this marketing automation. So um, I know we're, we're kind of coming to the end of our, of our time here together, um, but I want to show you one last quick slide and then we'll start and we'll, we'll take some questions, which is just I want to make the point that, that oftentimes when we think about marketing, we think about marketing as happening at the very beginning of the funnel and then your, your advisors or recruiters or, or, or whatever you might call them take over. But these tools do offer some opportunities for marketing to push deeper into the funnel, even through the application process, even through making sure that people who apply and accept it get enrolled in the program. And even once people are enrolled, to make sure that those people then stay in the program to help with retention and engagement, even while people are enrolled, to help move them all the way through to graduation. So I think there's some interesting capabilities of the marketing automation tools to, to engage with students throughout their entire life cycle that has been difficult um, until we've had systems like this. Okay, so at this point, Nicole, I'm going to turn things back over to you and see if we have any, any questions from the audience. All right. Um, if you have a question, you should be able to see a place on the dashboard where you logged into our webinar where you can ask a question. Um, I'll, give, I'll give us just a minute for people to ask that. Um, John, one that's coming up is, um, do you, uh, did JMH look at different systems like Pardot and Marketo? And are, if you are using one, why did you choose the one that you chose? Oh, um, good question in, in terms of marketing automation systems. Um, so, well, for us, our criteria might have been a little bit different than, than what uh, some of our, our um, higher ed departments would choose. We were actually looking for one where we could handle multiples of our clients um, within, within one system. Um, but I will say, so we, we are using Marketo right now, um, and Marketo offers some search engine optimization tools that some of the others don't offer. Um, and has just really robust the behavioral tracking capabilities were important to us to know what that means is um, what people are doing when they're visiting the website, what, what they're looking at while they're on there, exactly what they're interacting with so that we can use that to build a, a really thorough profile of those individuals. So those are a few of the things that, that, we, um, that we looked at. Wonderful. Um, well, here, another question just came in that I think is a great question that I know that we have, um, we have toyed with, and that is how do you balance the waiting game of tracking success of different, ca different campaigns versus cutting losses and moving on to other methods? 
And um, for the sake of this conversation, John, why don't you talk about cutting losses and moving on to other platforms? Because that's certainly something that we have, um, that we've looked at and tried to balance as you uh, move towards optimizing something. Sure. Um, well, I will say that my, my staff knows very well that I am, I, I hate giving up on a platform. Uh, and, and I tend to encourage us to, to keep tweaking and trying to improve platforms for, for maybe longer than some of my, my team are comfortable with. Um, but, but really, I, I think that's important, though, that, that, you know, if you try some ads on a platform, many of these platforms are so new and there are not yet best, best practices on them. So oftentimes when we take a first shot at something, we make sure we keep our spend low so that we can learn and not blow through thousands of dollars. But oftentimes our first attempt doesn't work and we need to make, you know, we need to make adjustments and, and try it again. So I always say, I want to see before we cut our losses, I want to see that we have tried several different approaches to the ads, different imagery, different messaging, and I want to see that we have tried different approaches to the targeting. Because it could be that we're reaching the wrong target audience, or it could be we're reaching the right target audience with the wrong messaging. So once we've tried two or three tweaks to both of those and it's still not working, that's usually when we would cut our losses and move on. Okay, great. Um, and because it is three o'clock, I'm going to say this will be the last question. Um, if you have questions that haven't been answered, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can find John's phone number and mine as well. This is Nicole at on our website at www.jmhconsulting.com. And we are also going to send out, when we send out the email about with the webinar recording, we will also be offering a free assessment of your social of a social media um, campaign that you have going on. So some of these questions that I see coming up, um, that might be answered in that free assessment. Um, but to answer the last question that I am choosing, and I apologize if we didn't select your question. How do you convince others that a marketing automation system is a necessity and that it has a different role than a CRM? And I think this is a great question. Um, I'm going to say this because I watched our team members, John, try and convince you that, there, that it had a different role. So I think that's a great question for you to answer as we initially started to explore this. Yeah, a while back. that's I, that's what I challenge them with, because these systems are not cheap. The, a marketing automation system will likely cost you some at, at minimum around ten thousand dollars a year and, and possibly more, depending on which system you choose and what you're going to do with it. So um, they're not inexpensive. Uh, and and what I really ask them to do is is just to answer the question I think that, that you've posed, which is. Um, what does this do that's different than a CRM? And are we confident that those things that it can do will add enough value to justify the cost and then some, right? Because if it's just a break even, that's still not a good business decision. So I really said, you know, tell me, make the business case. And, and the business case was, you know, if we are using this with, with graduate degrees and we can get one or two new students that would not have otherwise enrolled, it almost always makes sense, right? Because of the dollar figures involved. If you're, if you're marketing non-credit programs, it may or may not, um, depending on how well equipped your team is to use it. And that's the last thing I'll say about, uh, about it to kind of wrap up that is that what I have learned in, in our use of these marketing automation tools is that they are, they are incredibly sophisticated. And it's going to take you several months. We, we're now on kind of like a six month uh, time frame is what I think we're, we're in the midst of it. And we're starting to get some value out of it. But we are still working through the implementation for a client that started three months ago. So it's going to take some time to get those built out. And even then, there's more that you can do with them. So if you are in a place where you have the resources that you can commit to a marketing automation tool and knowledgeable people who can do the things that need to be done in the tools, they can add a lot of value. 
But if you aren't, and, and if you aren't able to say yes to those questions, I think it's going to be tough to convince um, others in your in your department or your school that it's a good business decision. Great. Well, we are over our time. So, uh, John, thank you. Jim Fong, thank you. And thank you, everyone who has joined us today. As I said, we will be sending out a recording of the webinar with an offer to um, look at and assess one of your social media campaigns. Feel free to take us up on that offer. And I hope everyone has a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.